Welcome back to another episode of the Two Christian Dudes podcast, where my friend Randy Kay and I have conversations with amazing people. As you've already figured out, if you've listened to or watched the earlier episodes in the season, for season one, we are talking about near-death experiences. And today we have an amazing guest. His name is Captain Dale Black. I know you're going to be touched by his story. Some of you I know are going to be challenged by his story. Uh, but I know that as you listen, as you watch, uh, you're going to learn more about Jesus. You're going to learn more about heaven. And my prayer for this conversation is that you're going to be encouraged. And who knows, maybe somebody in this conversation, uh, you're going to meet Jesus for the first time today. I'm always excited to see uh, what God plans to do through these conversations. Let me bring these fine gentlemen into the conversation. Randy, it's always good to see you, my friend. And Captain Dale, I've been looking forward to talking to you for some time. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be with both of you. And Great Randy, take you. it away, my friend. I, you know, I uh, we call you Captain Dale uh, Black because uh, for 40 years, I believe, you were an airline pilot and you flew many missionary uh, flights and uh, you were also a, a flight instructor. And so I don't want to lead too much into your story. But you're doing ministry now with Dill Black Ministries, and I have been uh, an observer and a participant within that ministry as well. Uh, Dale, you have impressed me in terms of your story because of your love for the Lord. And I know that that evokes a certain degree of uh, emotion. So um, if you can just walk us through what happened to you on that faith faithful day and um, how, how you were ushered uh, into heaven, your book, uh, Flight to Heaven, that would be greatly appreciated. We look forward to hearing. Yeah, no problem. And I'm glad to not share emotions because I don't, I don't have emotions. I, I, don't, uh, I don't reveal my emotions. I'm just very stoic and uh, very much in command, just like in the aircraft. Now, I, I did spend uh, 50 years as a pilot much of that as an airline pilot and uh, with a with an airline, a couple of different airlines, but I trained uh, pilots from just about every U.S. airline that there is. And uh, I, I ended up, my retirement was as a FAA flight examiner in the Boeing 737, although I had flown 727, 7, uh, 707s in the early days, went up to the 747. And uh, mostly Boeing equipment. Uh, in addition, I owned a, uh, my wife and I, we founded and owned a jet charter company. And most of our clients were uh, Hollywood executives, Fortune 500 people. And then that kind of led to uh, when the body of Christ started uh, bringing airplanes, uh, jet aircraft into their ministries. We did some selling of airplanes to ministries, and we trained their pilots. And in many cases, we provided, uh, you know, free services to a lot of ministries for for a lot of years. But yeah, I always dreamed of someday retiring and becoming an author, just writing books and sharing uh, the stories, the thousands of hands-on experiences that I believe God uh, put into my heart and in my life. Uh, the trying to just not be a preacher. I wasn't a preacher. I wasn't a pastor. I wasn't a paid uh, a clergy at all. I was a pilot. I owned a business, and we sold jet airplanes uh, as a hobby, and it became a wonderful thing to do. And uh, God just led one step at a time. But it began, it began really uh, when I was uh, 19, I was a passenger. I was, I was a volunteer co-pilot, but I ended up being a passenger on a twin engine airplane, a propeller driven airplane, an aircraft called the Piper Navajo, a 10 passenger <clears throat> airplane. We were carrying cargo out of the Burbank airport flying to multiple places around California. <clears throat> and this had been probably my 50th or 60th flight. Uh, I was pretty comfortable. 
even though I was only 19, uh, I I had about 100 hours in this aircraft, and I I ended up uh, becoming a volunteer co-pilot. We arrived that morning. Uh, three pilots were there. Gene was in the left seat. I was sitting co-pilot, expecting to serve as a first officer as as usual. Pilot command Chuck was in the temporary third seat behind us, and uh, we taxied out for takeoff. The weather was perfect. No rain, no clouds, uh, uh, great visibility. It's going to be another great July day. And this was July 18th, 1969. <clears throat> we had uh, already taken off. Uh, the The story was that Apollo 11 was en route uh, to the moon. And this is right in between their uh, space flight between Earth and, and the moon. So uh, we took off and just before takeoff that day, I got tapped on the shoulder by the boss, Chuck, who was my flight instructor, and he was like my older brother in a lot of ways. And he told me to flip flop seats. So I got out of the seat uh, in the co-pilot. He got in and he strapped himself in. We started rolling down the runway. We we're building up speed, 60 knots, 80 knots, 100 knots. We usually rotated the aircraft, which means you bring the nose of the airplane up, that's called rotation. And we usually rotated about, oh, 100 knots. And for some reason that day, I remember that Gene uh, rotated a little early, uh, surprised me, but the airplane went up, it started climbing up, the gear was selected up, the power was normal, and max thrust we had, and the airplane started climbing normally. Everything seemed pretty normal until we got to about 100 feet AGL. We were just above the ground, AGL above the ground. And uh, I noticed then this strange sound, a horrendous whine and dissynchronization between the two engines. And something was horribly wrong. That was clear within about a second. And I started scanning the dials to see what could possibly be wrong. And I was looking, and the, about that time, Chuck yelled in the cockpit. That's never done, by the way. Uh, he barked and yelled and said, let's land in that clear area over there. And he pointed with his left hand. And I looked up. I, I leaned up in that chair, and I looked up, and I saw what looked like uh, a park, a bunch of green grass. And I thought, oh, my gosh, we're going to be the headlines of tomorrow's newspaper. Strange, but that was my last thought. I watched Chuck grab the flight controls with both hands and turn them all the way left, all the way back against his chest. And that was my last uh, uh, memory. And the rest of it takes place. Uh, I find out later, but we had slammed into a, the book Visiting Heaven says it's 70 foot tall, but on the 50th anniversary, we had a, a ceremony there and the people that designed the the curator and the building, and they, they indicate it's 120 feet tall. That's quite a difference. And it's easy to understand why it's uh, hard to, uh, it, it's so surrounded with everything, but it's, it's, it doesn't matter how tall it is. It was a big building, and it's very solid. And we impacted that uh, at about the 75-foot mark uh, at 135 miles an hour. And with that impact, uh, the airplane just broke into uh, a couple thousand pieces, and there was no cockpit to be in anymore. It's not like a big jet. It, this is a, a small... Uh, Airplane, uh, maybe as big as your living room, but uh, still, that's not that big. And the three pilots, all three of us, slammed into this immovable object, kind of like two cars going head on uh, on the freeway, that kind of impact. And it was lethal. It actually caused fatalities, of course, that impact, that blunt trauma. And then the three pilots fell, all three of us, just right next to each other on the ground. And uh, the strangest part is right now, this is where I can tell you that I was looking down 
confused, looking down at three pilots, not knowing that I was in that airplane, really not knowing anything was wrong, but I'm in a sense, scratching my mind, my head, in a sense. And I'm looking down and I look at the first pilot in uniform and I go, man, he is dead, no doubt. But I didn't recognize right away who that was. And then I look at the second pilot and, oh my gosh, that's Chuck Burns. He's he's my flight instructor. He's my good friend. And uh, he looked dead. And then the third body was... Uh, was me. And I looked down and I'm trying to say this quickly, but I had no pain. I had really no worry, but I was completely confused as to why I'm looking down at three pilots. One of those people is me. And it hit me all of a sudden it hit me, not about the cause of the crash and other, but what hit me was that I realized, oh my gosh, that's not me. I'm up here. That's not me. That that's my body. I'm Dale Black. Not that my name means anything. It doesn't. That's just who I am. That's my name. And I'm Dale Black and I'm up here. I am a spirit. And I have a soul. And I used to live in that body, but I'm not that body. And all of a sudden I realized in my youthful 19 years. I had always thought that I was my body. Maybe no one else has, but I sure have. I thought that was me and that maybe I have a spirit. I don't know what that means. And I have a soul. I don't know what that means. And I guess the soul lives forever. But I didn't really, at age 19, I had never understood this. And right then, above my body, I realized I'm a spirit. I have a soul, my mind, my will, my emotions. My spirit, my soul, they live forever. And that's who I am. And my body is nothing more than the tent, the, you know, the the thing that houses my spirit and my soul. But that's not really me. And I understood the eternal perspective. And I got that before uh, anything else. The next thing that happened was there was ambulance showed up and there were three. Uh, there's a good picture of this too. There's a it's in the it's in the book of visiting heaven. But uh, th that book shows a picture of three Lockheed aircraft employees that had run over, and these are engineers, so they know aviation and they know a little bit about fuel and combustion. And we had fuel drenched over everything. And in fact, for months later, my body, the skin on my body would peel off really thick because I was drenched in that same uh, toxic fuel. But we had no fire, which is a miracle. I don't need to probably go into that, but it's a, it's a big thing to me that there was no fire and there's two very hot engines that were sitting there amongst that fuel and there was, there was no fire. Guys, uh, you might want to know this. I, I was an NTSB uh, a volunteer. I was a FAA accident prevention counselor. I spent 50 years in aviation. That was my entire life. And I did over 100 accident investigations with big jets and small corporate jets and um, corporate recip as well. And most every accident included fire. It's just so common to have fuel and heat and, and plenty of oxygen. And there was no reason logically in the world that our Navajo didn't explode, uh, if not at the top of the monument, certainly down at the bottom of the monument. And there was no fire. I can only tribute God as a miracle working God. But anyway, the ambulance shows up. There was life left in me. Thank God to, for this third paramedic who resuscitated me on the scene. And I was put in an ambulance with Chuck. Uh, back in those days, that was common. We were thrown in the same ambulance, two paramedics working on us. And strangely, uh, my body was in there and I was looking through the window the whole time, chasing. I call it an ambulance chase. It makes no sense. you know. I uh, 
I love things that make sense. I love logic. I like business. I like math you know, to a point. You know, I like things that are quantifiable and that you can prove. And anything that you can't prove, I don't like. I'm not. Uh, I'm not really uh, the kind of person that talks like this. And yet here I am. God uh, gave me this experience, and I guess it's like you, Randy. Uh, you have a similar kind of background in a lot of ways, I've learned. And uh, here we are talking about what happened to us. And it's real. And it happened. And I can't explain very well how or why it happened. All, all I know is that my entire life changed at that moment when I woke up from the hospital. But anyway, back to the hospital. I'm now uh, put in a gurney. Chuck is put on a gurney. I'm watching this from about five feet above my body. We're raced into the emergency room. Chuck goes into one room. I lose track of him. I go into another and I'm hovering above my body, just below the acoustical ceiling. And I'm watching them cut off my gray slacks, my white shirt with the apple lips and my wingtip shoes. And uh, a doctor, a gray headed doctor comes in and starts uh, giving me the paddles. And uh, I guess I had been in and out of uh, consciousness life. I don't know if I was clinically dead. I would say I was clinically not dead. I, it doesn't matter. The, the point is, I was right on the verge of uh, life and death. And uh, I remember none of this uh, in my brain. I remember every second of it in my heart. That's my spirit. And you are a spirit. That's your heart. And, and, and that's what God gave you, okay? So make sure you understand what I had to learn the hard way, that you are a spirit and you have a soul and you live in this body temporarily. You live in this body temporarily. I was in the hospital. I watched all of this. Um, it, it, I think it's important that I share, if it's okay with you folks, but that while I was looking down at my body and I'm still a little confused, I'm not, I'm not uh, hurting at all, but I'm thinking thoughts. It's too bad. It's too bad. I was only 19. Wow. I wish I had uh, done more. I wish I could have lived longer, but oh, I, okay. I, all right. I sort of deserve this. And then all of a sudden a movie a movie starts playing in my mind. Uh, it's like a a rewind of a certain part of my life. And uh, I was uh, 12 years old at a church camp in Southern California called Cedar Crest. I had come down to an altar at a cabin, and there was this masculine athletic minister who had invited the kids, I being one of them, that if they wanted to receive Jesus Christ and you were honest and sincere, come forward and he would pray for us. Well, I did. And he was praying for me. And I'm watching this, uh, this uh, event in my mind while I'm looking down at my body in the emergency room. It's still July 18th, 1969. And I realized that I had given my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. I invited him in. I meant it. I was serious. I was uh, genuine, and I had a zeal for him afterwards. And then I realized, wow, I had given my heart to the Lord when I was 12. And look at me now, the full of myself, self-centered, self-absorbed, selfish to the maximum. I was friendly, but inside, I was about as self-absorbed and self-centered as anybody ever could be. And I was ashamed and embarrassed and realized that I didn't deserve to live. And uh, I was a humongous disappointment uh, to God as a Christian. And yet, for some reason, that's the only event that played in my mind, that one little section of my life. And of course, I had had time to think about it. But interesting, the most important decision, the most important 
act I ever did was back when I was 12, when I honestly and severe, uh, sincerely invited Jesus to take over the controls of my life. And I hadn't thought about that experience for, I don't know, 17 years or 15 years. Never thought about it, didn't remember it until this airplane crash. And I guess that's kind of important because I'm alive now and I've survived over 50 years since that crash. And uh, I was born again. And God, in his mercy, answered the prayers of my grandparents who prayed for me daily by name. And I think God, I think God actually spared my life in answer to their prayers. Not that I deserved anything, because I didn't. Anyway, I start moving uh, out of the hospital room backwards, looking at my body, moving back, and I can't control it, and I can't steer it. I, I don't know what's happening, and, and it's it's written well, I think. We worked hard at it <laughs> with help from a, a couple of good editors, but uh, we worked hard at trying to tell this story uh, that's scientifically uh, completely scientifically unproven. My whole story is there's you can find out about the crash. That's everywhere. All the details are everywhere, and they always have been. But Actually, what happened to me is the best way to prove it is to just ask, what have I done with my life since? And uh, I woke up four days later after having this experience in heaven and back. I woke up, and when my eyes opened on the morning of the fourth day, In a coma, I was like a completely different person. Nothing looked the same. Nothing seemed the same. Uh, a ridiculous example might be, if you remember the movie, uh, The Wizard of Oz, she went from a black and white, and then all of a sudden, it's color and dimensional. That's, that's ridiculous. But in a way, I felt like someone had given me new eyes when I woke up from the coma. I tried to talk to the nurse, and uh, <laughs> I couldn't. I was trying to talk, and I had all these stitches in my face, and I felt like I was ripping my face apart. But I was trying to tell her, and I think the noise came out just muffled and garbled. She, she could hear I was trying, but I was trying to say this. Nurse. Do you know God? Do you know Jesus, his son? You've got to know him. You, you've got to know him. He's real. Heaven is real. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> and all she would say is, Dale, are you awake? Doctor, doctor, Dale. And, and then they came in. I couldn't talk. I, all I wanted to do was tell them about God and tell them that heaven is real and that Jesus is the way to God and he's his word is the framework. Everything we see around us, this is all, it's just a test. This is a, this is basic boot camp, in a sense, military training type. We're here to, this is a proving ground, a testing ground to, to get us ready for eternity with God in heaven. We have thousands of choices all day long. And what are we going to do with those choices? So I came back completely changed, human, frail still. But my life has never been the same. I've never beat on the same drum. And if I, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to point a uh, indicator that, you know, I've arrived and I'm some kind of a spiritual, you know, guru. That, that's, that's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is, that all I want to do is is please God. I, I'm I'm human. I make mistakes, but all I want to do is please Him and do what He wants me to do and go where He wants me to go and say what He wants me to say when He wants me to say it. Well, duh, I, I should have died on that 
on that airplane that day. My two friends did. And I go to their grave every year, especially Chuck's. And I think that every day that I've had since is a gift from God. But here's the deal. When I feel like the love of God is not flowing through me on a regular basis, when I feel like there's some kind of a clog between God and me, that usually happens when I get busy, start thinking about too much about the world that I live in, maybe something happens. But if I get too wrapped up in this world, then those new eyes that I was trying to describe to you a minute, I felt like someone had given me brand new eyes when I was in the hospital on the fourth day. But when I start losing that that spirit-filled anointing, in a sense, of God, then I know exactly what I need to do. I've learned the solution to that problem is for me usually to grab my dog, a border collie, and put it in my car, and I go up into the mountains alone and fast. And I talk to God, and I read his word, and I talk, and I go without food. Usually the first meal, I can't fast right away because I'm too much gotten in the flesh, so to speak. So I may have a first meal and then I'll go and I'll have less and less and finally uh, no no food. And by putting my body down, no food, the spirit inside becomes more dominant. And when the spirit becomes dominant, then you have control over your soul and your flesh, because your spirit is leading the way. And that's how God wants us to live as believers, to be dominant in the spirit over our soul, even our mind, our will, and our emotions, and certainly over our flesh, which is our body. So that's how I have learned to live my life. And (laughs) <laughs> two weeks ago, what did I need to do? I needed to get to the mountains because so many things were happening and I needed to get away. And that's exactly what I did, except I had to put my dog to sleep. She, she after 15 years, and this is my uh, fourth border collie. So you, I've had border collies for a lot of years. So I'm in between dogs right now. But I went alone this time and spent my time with the Lord. And I came back totally refreshed, totally happy, totally joyous because the spirit inside of me had gotten pushed down by the world and the pressures. And this world, is it not weirder now than it was, than it was a year and a half ago? That's an <laughs> understatement. <laughs> yeah, understatement. Yeah. This world is like whatever's up is down and whatever used to be right is left and it's inside and out. It's all mixed up, very confused. And what has happened? The the body of Christ, this is one way to say it, but the body of Christ has been, uh, been compromised for a long, long time. And we, as the body of Christ, we are the only thing holding back the evil. We're Without us, evil overruns, a lot like a a garden. If you don't weed your garden, the weeds will overcome your plants and your crops or whatever. And we need to do the same thing uh, with our world that we live in. We have to weed that uh, garden. And we, the body of Christ, we are the salt. We're the light. And uh, we're to take dominion. We're not to sit back and just... We're to take dominion over this over this earth. Uh, it, the, the world is Satan's, but but we are God's children. We are His army, and so anyway, that that's part of uh, that's part of what has changed me. And a lot of people say, "Well, how how do you know your story is true?" I can't prove it, but talk to anybody that knew me before. Talk to the people that know me now. I've changed. I've changed. Everything's changed. I I don't even take royalties 
I don't care. I, I we've given up. We had uh, we were re relatively well to do, and I grew up in a relatively well to do family. And it doesn't matter. Money is just a tool. It's a tool to do God's will, His work. And uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with work, working for the Lord. Even Jesus talks about that. And uh, do you know what you guys have between the two of you is you have this love of the brethren. I just met you both uh, for the first time, really, but I see the love of the brethren that is connected to your fiber. And, and that is more powerful than, than money or, or anything. The love of the brethren holds us together like, like cells in, in, in the body. And uh, I love that about the two of you. And now I can be the third dude possibly because we have we all three have that love. It's the love of God coming into us. And then when we are filled with his love, then it flows over to others. But first, we can't love others until we are full because it's an agape love, right? We have to have our own uh, cup filled up. And then it's the overflow that allows us to be, you know, ministers of the love of God and the, and the word of God in this earth. I think I think Dale just unofficially uh, invited himself to be a, a third co-host for future episodes. I'm sure we'll <laughs> be able to make that happen. Uh, Dale, I love that that garden analogy in the weeds. I feel like that really captures the season that we've walked through, the season we're continuing uh, to walk out here in 2021. Um, I, I want to pull a little bit more on the thread of just the the change for, from when you woke up. Um, I was listening to your audiobook this weekend, and uh, you know, like like you just said, uh, when you woke up, it was like scales came off your eyes, or you were looking through transformed eyes or different eyes. Um, and you know, as your story unfolds, you just talk about how you actually cared about people. You you had a burden on did they know the Lord? Had they encountered Jesus? Um, you know, you, you worried about their heart and, and where they were at and, and uh, just contrast that for us, like how night and day different uh, was that from where you were before the accident? Yeah. Well, I, 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 w I didn't want to make it sound like I wasn't uh, a, a friendly guy. I think I was friendly. Uh, people in school uh, thought of me basically as friendly, but I knew how to be friendly and still be selfish. <laughs> that was easy to do. And what a person does in their spare time, free time, alone time, that tells a lot. And all I thought about was me and my goals and my ambitions. And, and I had big goals and I had big ambitions and they were to outdo my peers, my brothers. Uh, I was you know, I'm not trying to put anybody down. I just felt like um, I had been gifted, and why not just maximize everything? And I wanted to travel the world, and I wanted to own a lot of homes and apartment buildings, and I wanted very much to have, you know, like this, like the song when I was a kid, uh, you know, a girlfriend here and a girlfriend there, you know, I. That, that just sounds horrible, uh, but those were those were my thoughts. I, I was uh, my my dad really helped force me to go to a Christian college. He said, "Just go for one quarter, which is like a semester, and just see if you can get through one quarter." But I was already enrolled in another college, which was going to help me with my aviation goals. I went to this Christian college, and I did like it but I got kicked out of it for uh, disciplinary reasons. Not maybe what you think. I wasn't drinking and doing drugs, but boy, did I, did I want to challenge uh, authority on that campus. And I tried every practical joke there was. Uh, some of it's funny. Uh, some of it's shameful. But I got kicked out of the college, and I, and I deserved it. Um, so when this airplane crash uh, happened, I had been expelled permanently from a Christian college. I had shamed uh, the family reputation in that regard. 
And uh, when I woke up and then was put in a wheelchair and uh, they actually heard that I had had this change. And so uh, it was set up to where I would roll myself into the room and explain to the college, uh, the people that were authorities there. And I gave my testimony and convinced them that uh, I had changed and I would, I, would, I would be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus. So they let me in and uh, probably had nothing to do with the million dollar check that we wrote to, you no, know, I'm just joking. We didn't do that. They did let me back in and uh, it, it was a really good thing. I stayed in that college and gained a lot of spiritual growth that school is not far from where you are, Randy Kay. It was it was in Pasadena at the time, but now it's in a, it's called Point Loma Nazarene University. So that's where I my degree says it's from Point Loma, but it was actually from Pasadena College at the time. Anyway, it was a great college. I'm really glad to have gone there, but that was part of part of the change, and I just I stopped running around, stopped getting stopped fooling around, started trying to say, all right, what am I going to do with my life, Lord? What do you want me to do? And strangely, uh, there was no way I was going to be a pilot anymore. That was uh, that was gone. And there's no way I was going to be an ath athlete anymore because I had a college athletic scholarship. And those two things were just uh, gone from, from hope or from... Uh, because of all the injuries I'd had. And uh, it just so happened, I surrendered all of that. And I believed that if I walked in the Lord's word, that he would just give me whatever he wanted for me. And I was shocked and uh, pleased that little by little, I was able to get a baseball uniform back on. I couldn't use my left arm, but I never told my coach that. I just, I could, I could, I could, I did a, I did what I could to try to get back and to play baseball. And, um, but I graduated and started flying and I learned how to compensate for all of the physical uh, injuries I had. But I have to tell you guys, uh, I had 2200 vision in this eye and that was as good as it's going to get after a whole year. And then I learned that God's word is true. The Bible says if we're not going to walk by faith, I mean, we're going to walk by faith, not by sight. And I thought, whoa, wait a minute, because my eye was just a mess. And only my right eye, my left eye was great. But it had been cut in half, and both the, the, the retina and the pupil had been just severed. And they tried to stitch it back together. But it was going to be difficult forever to become a pilot. In that day and age, it was much more difficult to become a pilot. But uh, I was able to learn how to eye exercise and speak the word of God day in, day out, exercise my eyes, eat for my eyes. And about two years later, I took a really good eye test after, you know, how you exercise your arm, you know, you build your bicep, right? You can do that with your eyes. And the simplest thing to do is go get glasses. But what I did was exercise my eyes and do the work of speaking God's word into being. Anyway, I, I went 40 years with 20-20 vision in that injured eye, but I had to exercise and I had to keep speaking God's word over that injury. And my whole body is pretty much that same way. But I, I ended up just getting all of my, uh, pretty much most of my dreams that I had as a, as, a, as a child got fulfilled. But instead of grabbing those things like this, give me God, give me, I, I did it this way. You know, Dale, the thing that I think we clearly understand from your life and how that relates to um, the profound impact or change that happened to you through this experience and, and since then, 
and you're sharing now is the fact that you uh, became a very successful man in, in the worldly sense, uh, financially. Um, you didn't have any reason to, to talk about your near-death uh, experience or your afterlife experience. There wasn't any financial advantage to you. You told us and it's true, certainly, that you the royalties you don't keep and you dedicate it to the ministry. And we know that that's, uh, for anyone in ministry, we know that that's not always lucrative. lucrative. Um, so the advantage is clearly to uh, glorify the Lord. You know, one of the uh, things that asked is asked uh, most about my experience is uh, what was it like to to experience heaven, the afterlife, you know, what are the, some of the more ethereal things in the encounter with the Lord uh, that happened through that experience? Can you share a little bit about that? Um, you know, because you had a very transformative experience, uh, you know, after your uh, accident and your your near death. I I would I would love to. I I seldom. Uh talk about the things that I want to talk about because people just get lost. They don't, they don't understand it. I'm probably not a very good speaker uh, to explain it very well. I can write better than I could speak, I think, uh, but I have to edit it several times in order to get it correct. But, you know, everyone almost wants to know what I saw, what I heard. Uh, the eye candy and the ear candy, and that's that's great. I I can do that. Uh, but what most people don't ask, but I think you just did, Randy, and you would be the kind of person that would. But is, is what did you learn, Dale, uh, from your experience? And what I learned is, I think, profound. For example, when I got to the near the wall in the city of gold around the city in heaven, there was a welcoming committee that was just congregating to get there to meet me. And it looked like they had been assigned to meet me at the exact time that I was arriving. And this group came to meet me and greet me. And I could see by their smiles and I could see by the brilliance in their eyes and what appeared to be exuding love coming from every pore of their being, they loved me. They absolutely loved me unconditionally, and I could feel it and sense it and know it. Yet, not one of these people were a blood relative on earth. Not one of these per people was anyone that I had known personally uh, on earth. And that may uh, frustrate a lot of people because I've had a lot of emails come back and people have been relatively unkind about that. And they said, that's not possible. That's not right. Your story's not true because you're going to meet your family. You're going to meet. Oh, oh, okay, no, wait a minute. Time out. You know, my family is on the inside. I'm going to see them. But listen to what God taught me because maybe there's some value in learning what God taught me here. This. This family was, <laughs> what do you mean they're not my blood family? They're more my blood family than anything else because we have the same blood flowing through our veins. It's the blood of Jesus that binds us together. Even though I didn't know these people, they were my blood family. These were my brothers and my sisters in Christ, and nothing could possibly be more wonderful or more bonding than the blood of Jesus. So yes, they were my family. They are my family. And I would say this to anybody listening, if you know Jesus as your savior, if you're on your way to heaven, you're going to love it there for if no other reason, you are going to be surrounded with the most loving people, your brothers and the sisters, by the millions. They love you unconditionally for who you truly are, not who you want them to think you are, but who you truly are. That was mind boggling to me. And then when I woke up from the hospital and I sat in my wheelchair and I thought about this event and I sort of meditated on the event, I started realizing the Lord was talking to me. 
Dale, did you notice any uh, skin color differences between that family that I sent to you? And then I thought, yes. Yeah, there would be what we would call uh, white and black and, and Asian. And yes, there, there, there was. Dale, did you notice any gender differences there? Well, yes, I, I, I did. But did you notice it when you were there? Absolutely not. And then silence. And I connected the dots. In the silence, as God's talking to me, and I realized there is no racism in heaven. There's no racism in the body of Christ. There's no room for racism or this gender identity. We are brothers and sisters. And our bond is unbreakable. It's complete. It's thorough. It's fulfilling. Uh, this is what I learned in heaven, is that love is absolutely unconditional. And it's, it's uh, hard to describe because it does not exist on the earth. We might, I go around always hoping for it, looking for it. Uh, praying for it again, uh, but uh, it can happen. It, it, it could actually happen. And the best way that it could happen on earth, if I can say, because I've been in little glimpses of that, you take a group of believers and you put them together and isolate them together. And they have one assignment. Your assignment is to do what Jesus told the disciples to do in the upper room. Go and tarry. And when you're basically wait for the Lord, and so you pray and you fast, not every meal necessarily, but you do some fasting and you read God's word and you spend whatever time necessary. What, what happens is the walls of pride and ego and selfishness start slowly coming down. The masks start coming off. And what we find here is that the Holy Spirit's love, this unconditional love, gets more and more and more real in our everyday life. And you see, when Jesus told his disciples to go into the upper room, they, be, they became in one accord. And when that occurred, the Holy Spirit came and descended on them. We can have that on this earth. We seldom have it. We seldom see it, but it is possible. And I'll tell you, it's it's happened to maybe a half a dozen times. And I, I long for it. And I love it. And this is what we as believers can expect. But we need to get rid of ourselves and let God have complete control of us. And then there's that oneness. So that's just one, that's one thing. What did I learn? I learned that there is no racism. I learned that love is unconditional. And, and I, I learned that there's no sin. And it's kind of weird. We're, all of us are in rooms right now, and we're breathing air, and we don't even think about it. We're inhaling, exhaling. We don't think about it. Our minds are on other things. But when I was in heaven, I was trying to put my finger on what in the world is this? Oh my gosh, there's no sin. There's there's no sin. Can you imagine? And and I'm sure you noticed that yourself, but there's no sin, there's no jealousy, there's no pride, there's no selfishness, there's just nothing but the joy of God, the love of God, the life and the light of God that fills all of us and everything in heaven. And that's the way God created it. We can have a glimpse of that here on the earth. And a lot of people say, oh, Dale, can't you, you just can't wait till you get to heaven. I'm sure you're just ready to go right now, aren't you? And on one side, yes, sure, of course, yeah. But, you know, all of us and everybody that are watching, you're already in eternity right now. You're already in eternity because you are a spirit, you are a soul. Those are going to live forever. Now, the only question is, where will you go? But your body will die unless, unless the Lord returns, and he very well may 
in our lifetime, the three of us, if we live to be a normal life span, we very well may see uh, the return of Jesus. And we can talk about that someday, but uh, this is just the way it is. We have eternal life guaranteed. We're going to have eternity guaranteed. And so in the meantime, the podcast that you guys are doing, Sean, Randy, you're touching lives. You're reaching people that would never be reached. And every day that you're doing this, every time you've touched someone, you're changing eternity for that person. So keep going, guys. Keep doing the great work that you're doing. And I know for myself, I'm going to just keep doing the same thing on a small scale. I'm not a big name ministry, probably never will be, but I love God and I want to have every breath that matter for him. And I want to help people find that Jesus really is the son of God. He really was the Messiah, that the, the promised Messiah was in Jesus. And uh, <laughs> you can trust him. You can trust his word. And uh, to follow him with your life, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. That's like that. just one thing. <laughs> yeah, please, please. No, I'm just saying that, that's just one thing. <laughs> that was just one thing that I learned in heaven. Those. Well, I, I think that does, definitely deserves an amen. And uh, I have a question I want to ask but Randy. I want to give you an opportunity to comment. Uh, obviously, uh, Dale was sharing things that probably relate and touch on your story as, as well. Anything you want to con contrast or comment on with what Dale just shared? We are simpatico, uh, Sean. Um, you know, I've read his story. I know exactly what he means by the eye candy, you know, talking about people want to want to know about the color of the the rose, the stone, the, you know, the majesty of heaven. Uh, but it's all about the Lord. It's consumed uh, by Jesus Christ. Um, I, everything that you, you speak about, Dale, I'm like um, I'm in a heaven reunion. You know, I'm OK. I'm, somebody gets me, you know. Coming, going through, gone through this experience, because one of the things about your story in particular that has impressed me is you um, have a humility about you and an impact that is understated. Um, I've got to tell our audience that that Dale's impact in his ministry and on me personally is is profound, gargantuan. Uh, thousands upon thousands of people. But what's important, most important to you is glorifying your Lord. And I know that doesn't come naturally. It comes supernaturally through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so what you experienced in terms of meeting, uh, let's say, strangers in heaven who were of a familial nature in heaven by virtue of the blood of Jesus Christ had the same thing. You know, these are my brothers, my sisters. Um, I had um, a similar salvation experience uh, that you had. My salvation experience was with a uh, boy who had prayed for me. See, this, this is another thing we have. We get emotional when we talk about this. Yeah, how shame, can you not? shame on you, Randy. You, you I know. Go. I said, I'll <laughs> repent after this. But, you know, it's like, <laughs> um, yeah, how can you not? How can you not? Um, you know, you and I have been methodical. I came from the medical side. You came from, you know, the aeronautics side. Both of them require a great deal of science and mathematics. And so we don't uh, naturally come from the bent of talking uh, maybe about the, the ethereal things. Um, and then that profound experience, you know, being, you know, that the fact that there is no distinction of race, of gender and any of these things that this world just emphasizes ad nauseum, right? <laughs> that we it, it, it defines people in this world, and people yeah. want others to be defined by that. In heaven, there's none of that. So all of those things, Sean, were certainly analogous uh, to to my experience, and that's that's I think the the takeaway that we will uh, understand through uh, through this interview with Dale and others is that. You know, if, if, if there's so many commonalities that we have, especially those of who, us who knew Christ going into this experience, um, 
that there's something to this. And we're kind of in a way, Dale, you're speaking to us prophetically. You know, this is what you, I'm speaking to you, the viewer. This is what you have to expect. This is your future. Do not fear death. Do not fear dying. Heaven is in your future. I love what you said, Dale, that eternity is now. We're living in eternity. And that, that is uh, that's a, that's so special uh, in that you highlighted that fact. There's a, there's a lot of people that that have said uh, and 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 well first of all you, amen Randy amen to what you said praise the Lord for what you said and how you said it there's a, a lot of people that have said well I just I'm I'm too old or I'm too sick or I'm too um, I'm too poor I've been beat up so much I've been abused I've been on drugs you know they have every excuse in the world. And they said, there's nothing I can do, nothing I can do here on this earth. And I, I keep thinking about how important the prayer life that Jesus had when he was on earth, how he would go away and be alone when the disciples were sleeping, and he would spend time. This is a son of God. This is a guy with the Holy Spirit in him, but he's on the earth now. He's in his fleshly body, but he's spending so much time with God in order to still have that oneness with God and to be able to have the power of God in his life. And so I say, uh, you know, people that say, well, I can't do anything. I, there's nothing that I can do. Well, there was one that was paralyzed. And of course, we prayed for paralysis to be, you know, defeated. And that's a tough one. We, we, we've known that that's one of the more tough, tough things to do. But this person finally understood that they could do something, even paralyzed. They could pray. They could spend their living days, every day they could pray. And you know, that is a purpose for a lot of you watching right now that say, well, I, you know, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a this or that. I'm not a, a successful business person, whatever. But can you pray? Can you pray maybe a half an hour a day or an hour a day? If you'll pray an hour a day, you will change your world if you'll spend an hour a day in prayer. And that's something to challenge everybody with. Find, find what God would have you do. Some have many talents. Some have uh, untapped reservoir of talents and gifts. Turn those over to God. You want to have happiness? Enjoy. There's nothing greater than taking what God's given you and giving it away. You know, love is something you can't keep, something that must be given away. And when you give it away, you get it replenished uh, on steroids. You just get more of it. So take what God has given you, give it away, and you'll find more joy, more peace, more, more purpose. And that's what this living life is, I think, about. And, uh, you know, I'm older than you guys by maybe six months, seven months. I don't know. But I think, I really do think there's a good chance that we will see uh, the rapture in our lifetime if we live healthily as we should. And I'm watching for this peace treaty. I'm watching for it, see if it's going to evolve into the prophetic treaty that will kick off the 70th week of Daniel, which would mean once that peace treaty is signed and confirmed with a certain amount of nations and a certain group of people between Israel and certain people, then we can literally set our watch. How do I do that? We can set our watch to the timetable that's in Daniel and in Revelation, and we pretty much know what's going to happen then. And it won't be, in my research, it won't be a rapture right away. There will be a rapture, and it will allow the body of Christ to not go through the great tribulation. But there will be some seals poured out in my judgment. Uh, I won't argue with this with anybody, but I believe this is what the, the Bible says. There will be some difficulties and some persecution, and uh, this will be the this will be required to purify the body of Christ. But if I can say, since I opened my 
mouth and got started on this subject, I probably ought to finish and simply say, but there is that remnant church that God has protection for, a supernatural protection during a time of difficulty all over the globe. But God protects the faithful church. And there's scripture after scripture that I can allude to later. I'm working on a book on this subject. And so it's fresh on my mind. Well, and, and I guess my comment would be is, while every generation has thought they were in the end times, we definitely have seen myriad prophetic markers uh, that we are in a unique time. And there's a lot of things that seem to be lining up. So uh, I couldn't agree more that we may be that generation. May we be so blessed, really, uh, to be that generation that will yeah. see the return of our Lord and Savior. Uh, I've got one last question I want to ask. And after Dale's finished with answering that, Randy, we'll, we'll let you lead us towards wrapping up. Uh, but, but I want to touch back on something you said earlier, Dale, about healing. You talked about, um, you know, you, you were praying and contending and declaring for your eye. But that doesn't, if, you know, for if anybody's read your book, that doesn't mean you were just sitting in the corner praying. You were exercising your eye and trying to read with your eye. and You were doing a bunch of different things. So, um, and, and that was just one of many challenges that you had to overcome physically with the damage that had been done to your body. Um, just talk to us briefly, uh, briefly about kind of that combination of you know contending praying speaking god's truth over the different parts of your body but also taking action i feel like often people just want to declare and pray but i feel like uh, actually taking actions at that same time it is a is a bigger faith step because you're at be, by setting something in motion you're like partnering with what you're declaring that this is going to move forward i'm really believing that god is going to do with that i feel like that's where many of us stop short so help us to just understand what you learned about that connection. Yeah, excellent question, Sean. And, and, and it's a complex question, and we'll have to unravel it like uh, an onion layer by layer. But yes, God is a healing God, no doubt about it. His word is clear that he turned no one away when Jesus was on the earth. Anyone who came to him for healing, he would answer the prayer. And he did it in different ways, but he also said, your faith has made you well. So Jesus, his word is true that healing is of God. No doubt about it. There's also no doubt that faith is an important ingredient. Now, faith is not the same thing as hope. Hope is what most people in the body of Christ think is faith, and it's not true. Hope is something out there that you hope to get someday. That's hope. And there's a good uh, example. We need to have hope in the body of Christ. Hope is in the Bible, for sure. It's not the same as faith. Hope is out there, and you are hoping to have it someday. But faith is different. Faith sees that thing, grabs it, pulls it down into the here and now, and you possess it. That's That's the kind of that's the kind of uh, faith that we're talking about in the Bible. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We get faith, which is the evidence that you can't see, but it's, it is absolute evidence that you believe that what you don't see is here. So hope is out there. You hope to get it. Faith, you grabbed it and you brought it into the here and now. And we need both hope, but faith is different. When you pray in faith, well, things change. See, prayer doesn't change God. Prayer changes circumstances. If you pray with faith, then you'll change the world in which you live. So one layer is, yes, we need to pray. We need to root our prayer in God's word. And if we do that, we're going to find that God's word and his will are the same. God and his will, his word and his will are not different. They are the same. And when we learn about God's word in great detail, we find that God's will is always for healing. That's God's will for healing. Now, there's another thing. I've learned that we human beings, especially Christians, we want things to be simple. We want it to be easy. And we'll take the simple route every time 
the simple, easy, quick answer. And you know what? That usually doesn't work because, um, for example, how many people do you know that have actually been cured of cancer? I mean, really cured, not a five-year uh, remission. I mean, cured. How many people have you heard and seen that have been miraculously healed? And uh, the, the fact of the matter is, when you do research on the medical industry, we see that the Christian church is really not much different statistically than the world. If people get cancer, if you're a Christian, the statistics are still that that person is as likely to die as the non-believer. And that should not be the case at all, but it is the case. That is the case. So something's wrong. And I have seen both sides of the spectrum for a lot of years. And I have learned that what I did when I was a young kid, I didn't even understand what I was doing right. It took me a while to realize that I had certain things in place that a lot of Christians don't have. I did not have in place. I didn't understand faith. I didn't understand healing. There was a lot I didn't understand about understanding that God can and will do anything. But what I did know is that God works precept upon precept, that God would bless my effort. I didn't understand how important that was because I grew up with an emphasis in that. My dad, my grandfather, they were important in that respect. So I have learned that the way to get answers to prayer, especially in healing, but always, is to add the supernatural with no limitations on it, bring in the supernatural miracle power of God and the natural. Put the practical and the natural together. And when they work together, uh, you, you can't lose. You just can't lose. Take the most common, biggest healing problem in the world it just happens to be an area of my expertise because I've spent 25 years in researching cancer. I'm not a medical doctor, so I'll, I'll let you know that. I have a PhD, and I know how to research, and I learned that, thank God. God did this, not me. I just put the effort for it. But he taught me how to research. And there are others that are better than I am, but I learned how to research. And I took the aviation skills of researching aircraft crashes when my wife got cancer. And I took those same skills and applied them over here and realized that, my word, almost every one of us give cancer to ourselves. If you've been diagnosed with cancer, <laughs> it's not a disease that you just happen to get. Oh, darn. You're, you're, it's caught you. No, we give ourselves cancer by the way we think, by the way we speak, what we eat, drink, and how we handle stress. So that's a natural part. But if you take the natural and learn how to speak right, think right, eat and drink right, and deal with stress correctly, and add that to faith in God, faith in his word, knowing the power of God and how he always, always answers prayer. You put those two things together, that's where you can literally see mountains move. And this is how I believe God created the universe. I know this probably going uh, beyond some people. Is, and it isn't, it's certainly not you, you guys, but, you know, we take a, a thermonuclear bomb and we have a little bit of plutonium in there and we take this matter and when we it, you know we compress it it becomes matter becomes just an enormous amount of energy but if 2 times 2 is 4 and you take 4 and divide it by 2 you come up with 2 it's the same thing in reverse you can take energy and turn it into matter and those what are those big photoelectric uh, acceler accelerators? I forgot. I've forgotten what they're called right now, but they accelerate photons almost at the speed of light, and they slam them into each other, 
And I've watched and read and studied the, uh, the effects of that impact of two photons colliding at over the speed of light because they come at each other. And what happens is this energy turns into matter. And so when God spoke, let there be light, he spoke it with faith in his heart. And there was energy, and there was so much energy because it's Almighty God and it's faith in his heart. And it spoken out of his mouth created matter. The heavens and the earth and all that was created came this way. We need to tap into the same principles that God did. It's important what we say. It's also important what we don't say. And if we're trying to get an eye healed, for example, if we're just trying to see, we don't want to say, Lord, I believe that you're a healing God. Your word says, if I ask, I will receive. If the door is knocked, it will open. It, and, you know, God, you'll answer prayer. And then as soon as I pray that prayer, I turn to my wife or my partner or whatever. And I say, well, I just hope it works this time. Still can't see anything. I'm just not, I'm no better. I'm no better. This is, you know, just an eye but uh, illustration. But the same thing is with cancer. You can't talk that way in private and expect God not to hear you. Your spirit is going to hear what you're saying. You are, what does the Bible say? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So what are you? Are you a man of faith or a woman of faith? Or are you a woman of hope and no faith? Or are you in the process of going from hope to faith? But one thing you want to do is you want to speak God's word, which is his will, and don't let anything come out of your mouth other than that. And if you slip and if you make a mistake, you do the same thing as you do if you slip if you're a bit on drugs and now you've just gone back, you do the same thing. You go back to God and say, Lord, help me. I'm so sorry. Forgive me for what I just said. I render those words null and void. And some people say, wait a minute, Dale. Are you a name it and claim it type of person? I don't know. I don't know what you call me. I don't know. All I know is this is how Jesus spoke. This is how the word of God spoke. This is how we're supposed to speak, and we're to take dominion over our own bodies, over our own world. We're to take dominion. Jesus said that if we will <laughs> take dominion, we can walk on serpents and on scorpions, and we will have, we're not to fear, but we'll have power over all of the enemy, and nothing by any means will hurt us. Anyway, back to your uh, question, Sean, and and Randy as well. Faith is real. It's power. It comes out of your heart and then out your mouth. And when it's real, when your heart and your mouth say the same thing, you got faith, and that is going to move things. But blend the supernatural with the natural, the miraculous with the practical, and watch God work. Yeah, we've been to church and uh, so blessed by your sharing. You know, this is a man who has, um, let's say, been to a place that doesn't require as much, if uh, at all, faith in heaven. That is, when you're in heaven, everything is as it is in Christ or uh, that God has ordained, and you're there. So you don't need to. Kind of hope or uh, necessarily believe that there's a heaven because you know it and you know it because you're there and this is a man who's been there um in a fatal flight accident uh and it is a wowza story so thank you so much dale for sharing uh, today i know our audience has been blessed by your story your message and the fact that you are uh, truly uh, a changed man uh, by the power of uh, Jesus Christ. So uh, we want to know how to find you and your ministry, your books. Uh, tell us how we can how we can find you. 
there. Well, that's very kind of you to ask. But yeah, you can just go to daleblack.org, simple name, daleblack.org. Uh, and there we have a online church you can find out. We do videos, uh, usually two per week. We, in our store, we have the, the books and we're trying to write uh, one to uh, one to about one book a year to uh, maybe two books every three years. That's kind of our goal. And I've had an assignment just recently. I mean, I'm ready to do whatever God tells me to do. But recently, um, I felt like he's put his hand on my shoulder and said, okay, Dale, good job. Well done. Good. Okay. A uh, few little tweaks. But now, everything I've taught you, I want you to put it in writing. And and uh, I said, now, Lord, glad to do it if that's what you're telling me to do. But if we're in the last seven years, what's the point? And uh, back, hand on the shoulder, Dale, what did I just tell you? Put everything in writing. Okay, no problem. No questions asked. That's it. So now my uh, my my thorough enjoyment is to try to write uh, everything that he's taught me, and uh, who knows what God will do with it, but that's that's my new assignment. But daleblack.org is where uh, you can find us. Well, Dale, let me also say thank you so much for sharing with us today. And, you know, honestly, you know, I, I've, I've talked to Randy many times and got to meet you for the first time today. And I, I would feel like I was uh, not getting the full experience if you weren't emotional, because uh, I, I feel like it just, it just, gives credibility for how much you change. You know, people often will say uh, when they're in heaven, they just, everything is love and and how you could not be shifted or after being immersed in love, after being that close to Jesus. So, uh, you know, I, I'm honored that you can just be yourself and share uh, and just be transparent. And, and that's really what we want to provide uh, with this podcast. It's just a place where we can have conversations with people that Randy and I find interesting, people that we're excited about but also give you as the audience, give you an experience where you just get kind of a, a raw, unfiltered answer. You know, we, we may explore things that some people are going to think are strange, some things that might make you uncomfortable, uh, but we really want you to encounter truth, transparency, and, and Jesus. And so uh, I think we've definitely accomplished that uh, in this conversation today. As Dale said, if you want to find it more, head over to his website, and you can find that at daleblack.org. Uh, we appreciate taking the time to watch or listen to yet another episode of the Two Christian Dudes podcast. Please like us, rate us, follow us in all the places, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to the show. Uh, be sure you subscribe, follow so you, you can uh, so we can keep you up to date on future episodes. Uh, Randy, always a pleasure to spend time with you, my friend. And Dale, uh, I, I, I think it's fair enough. I can probably call you one of my new friends. Just thank you for pouring into us today. I was encouraged. I can see on Randy's face he was encouraged. And Lord willing, we'll connect again sometime and have another fun conversation. Yeah, we're we're friends for life and, and then beyond into eternity. Friends forever. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Dale. Yes, thank Bye. you.